Let us pray together. God, open us up this morning as we have heard your word proclaimed that we might hear with joy what you say to us today. Would you open up our hearts and our minds, our very lives, that we might hear a word from you? Would you give us the kind of vision and, and sight that we need to face our world unafraid? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was, uh, it was freshman year of college where I realized that everything about me wasn't perfect. <laughs> that is, it, it was my vision. I realized I did not have perfect vision, 2020 vision anymore, and I found myself moving closer and closer to the front of the, the, the uh, classroom. I said earlier I got closer and closer to the blackboard and told the children if they needed to ask their parents what a blackboard was, that they were available for that. But I remember getting closer and closer to the front and the professor saying, I think you need to have your vision checked. And indeed, I did. And it turned out I had astigmatism and was nearsighted. How many of you have a, are nearsighted or have astigmatism? Yeah, how many of you are, are farsighted? How many of you, uh, how many of you uh, have 20-20 vision? The lucky few, right? The lucky few. It, it, our church does not reflect the population. 35% of the population is 2020, but I guess as we age, our eyes go, and so too sometimes our vision and the way in which we see things. We can see things in a number of different ways, both literally and figuratively. We can be so nearsighted where we only see what's right in front of us and fail to see the big picture, or we can be so focused on the big picture, on that 30,000-foot view where we see the forest and its beauty, but we fail to capture the details of the trees. Sometimes we can have that astigmatistic view where we just see things blurry, things not as they are. Sometimes we see things through rose-colored glasses, as they say. Everything is optimistic and positive and Pollyanna. No matter what the news may tell you, we have some folks among us, and you have experienced those who can only see the positive, and God bless them for it. Because there are others who have... I said, what's the opposite? I was Googling, what's the opposite of rose-colored glasses? And there's, there's not really an opposite, but you think of those glasses with smudges on them and scratches and grease and grime, or, or as the phrase is sometimes called, a jaundiced eye, where you see things and they're tainted and they're colored by experience. It's the sort of Debbie Downer eyesight where there's always something negative no matter how good things seem to be going. There's also some of us, and sometimes in our world, we can get to this sort of rear view vision where all we can do is look to the past, whether that's because of nostalgia and us looking fondly, thinking things can never be as good as it used to be, or we look to the past because we just can't move on from that thing that happened to us. We'll look at this in a bit. Or maybe sometimes in life we, we need blinders on because we can't help but look to the side to see what's going on all around us. The truth of the matter is, is whether you're nearsighted, farsighted, or have 20-20 vision, all of us can be a bit myopic or nearsighted in the way in which we approach life. You might wear bifocals or trifocals, or you may wear contact lenses, but each of us have a tendency to suffer from a bit of personal myopia where we focus on our own circumstance and our own situations we become so narrowly focused and nearsighted that it's only thing that matters is what's immediately in front of us. And oftentimes this is worsened by difficulties that come our way. When those difficult times spring up, we focus so much on those that it becomes difficult to see anything else. And the more narrowly we focus, the narrower our focus becomes and we begin to get used to it. And just like real eyesight, our eyes adapt and we find ourselves in more and more need of correcting. This, sometimes it, 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 this way of seeing sometimes uh, defines our reality. Uh, my kids are all, you know, in the place of getting grades. Even Henry is getting grades back. And I was reminded of being in second grade math and getting a 50 on that with the big D on it. And I thought my academic career was over in the second grade, right? No graduation, no class promotions for me. It was all over. 
Or maybe you think about those experiences, maybe as a first crush or a first dating experience where, you know, when that person broke up with you, you thought your world was absolutely over. Your world was like a Taylor Swift song, right? And it was, came crushing down. It was all you could see throughout life as we go on. This sort of myopia continues we get so focused on those kind of things, whether it's stress at work or fighting with our children that might just not last for the morning, but for many years. Distance in marriage, a divorce, layoffs from work, times of living paycheck to paycheck, or the effects of disease and death and those things that do us harm. It's in moments like these that we are wise to get our vision checked. And this morning, as we conclude our series on Joseph and the family matters that Joseph deals with, with his father and his brother, we see that there is a biblical prescription, which we could call 50-20 vision. Specifically, it comes to us from Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And it comes at the very end of a very long story. It's one of the longest narratives in all of the Bible of what happens with Joseph and his brothers from the time where he's an arrogant 17-year-old having received these dreams of God and he says, hey, brothers, you're all going to bow down to me. How do you like that? Well, they don't like it very much, do they? They sell him into slavery, leave him for dead, throw him in a pit. And over the years that follow, 22 years to be exact, Joseph goes from being enslaved to working in Potiphar's house to being accused of a crime he did not commit, imprisoned for at least two years, and then being raised up to the right hand of Pharaoh where he is given the role of prime minister. Throughout all of the ups and downs of Joseph's life, there is never a single time in, jo- in, in Genesis where we hear Joseph say, you know, I'm kind of getting used to this slavery thing. It's not as bad as it seems. We never have a time where Joseph says, you know, being in prison is really, really good. We don't have a time that we hear Joseph say, I'm so glad my brothers hated me so much that they killed a goat and poured its blood all over my beautiful colored coat and separated me from my family and friends for over 22 years. Not one time does Joseph call any of these life circumstances good. And yet, Joseph has a certain kind of vision. Having been planted in his dreams of what God would do to him and through him throughout all circumstances, Joseph's vision is clear And it comes to place in clear form in the ending chapters of the story. What we see for the brothers is that their lives, even after 22 years, have been narrowly defined by their sin. And by the circumstances that came as a result of what they had done to their brother As the story goes on in chapter after chapter, we see evidence that the brothers just can't stop looking in the rearview mirror. Their focus becomes more and more on what they had done and the effects that it has had upon their life and the life of their family. You may remember, if you have not read the story lately, Joseph's dreams had to do, excuse me, when Joseph was interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, Pharaoh has these dreams of these fat cows that get eaten up by these skinny little cows. And Joseph interpreted it to say, hey, Egypt and the whole land is going to go through seven years of plenty. So store up the grain because seven years of famine are on their way. And so seven years of plenty and two years of famine pass by and then on Joseph's door, comes knocking his brothers. They need food. They know the food is in Egypt, and so they come. And when they arrive, Joseph knows very clearly it's his brothers. He's not forgotten their face, but probably because of how Egyptian Joseph looks, they have no idea that it's Joseph. And so after Joseph tricks them a little bit, and you can go back and read the story with all sorts of trickery that runs in his family, Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. And he says this, I am Joseph. Is dad still alive? They don't hear anything past I am Joseph. The scripture tells us in Genesis 45 verse 3, but his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. 
immediately in revealing that it was Joseph before them, their minds were brought back to their greatest fear, their guilt, the shame that they had carried with them. They were afraid for their lives. Joseph has them return back to Canaan, bring Jacob with them back to the land, and there he sets them up, showing them not just in words but in action that he had forgiven them, that he had moved on, that his vision was clear and moving forward, and yet what we find is that the brothers simply cannot move on. Once dad dies, they all go back to Canaan to attend the funeral, and now that dad's dead, they begin to worry In Genesis chapter 50, verse 15, which we heard Jamie and read for us this morning, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph still holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? What if? It's here that Joseph introduces what could be called 50-20 vision. From Genesis chapter 50, verses 20, You intended to harm me, brothers, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Or as another translation puts it, and I like this, You planned something bad for me, but God has produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people just as he's doing today. You see, Joseph's vision is not nearsighted or farsighted. It's not rosy or jaundiced. He's not looking back to the past or from side to side. But this 50-20 vision keeps it in front of him that no matter what he sees before him, he knows that God is able to work good in any and every circumstance. 50-20 vision for Joseph reminds us of the biblical truth that runs from beginning to end, that the worst things that we experience in life are never the last things. Joseph goes through years in slavery, 11 years with Potiphar, at least two years in the prison. He goes from the pedestal to the pit to Potiphar's house to prison and to Pharaoh's palace. And all throughout that again, Joseph never says, this is great, I'm getting used to it. He doesn't say that his circumstances are good, but he's able to see that though they intended evil, though they intended harm, God, throughout all of his circumstances, was working good. Genesis 50, 20 vision tells us that the worst thing is never the last thing and that there's always another chapter to be written. Not just for Joseph's story, but for the brother's story as well. For as many times as Joseph has said that he forgives them and tries to treat them with kindness, they still cannot forgive themselves. And so it's when Joseph speaks to them these words, you plan something good for me, but God, excuse me, you plan something bad for me, But God produced good from it that they're able to see in which the biblical vision of God is made clear to them. Today, as we gave Bibles to our third graders and our kindergartners, I was reminded of just how much this kind of vision is present throughout all of the stories, throughout all of the ups and downs of the different characters in the Old Testament, through the prophets, through Jesus himself, and through those who followed in his example. In, Genesis, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we have the author recounting all of the lives of the different, quote, heroes of faith. Those folks from whose example we ought to learn from, those who we think of as, as going through great things for God. And yet what we find in Hebrews 11 is these kind of words. Some of these folks faced jeers and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins. They lived in caves and holes in the ground. But God had something better planned for them. And so they kept on through faith. The prophets remind us this of this 50-20 vision as well, where even as Jeremiah is facing 70 years of exile, of doom and gloom, where they're separated from their homeland, where their temple is in ruin, where they even feel excluded from the very presence of God, Jeremiah is able to remind the people, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. 
Jesus has this 50-20 vision. As he reminds his disciples, often the cross is always before him. His mission and ministry always had the cross in mind. And as he turns the corner towards Jerusalem, he tells the disciples that they're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priest. They'll condemn him to death. They'll hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise. It's a strange thing in Christian tradition that we call that day Good Friday because not a single one of those things on its surface is good. Being spat upon, being flogged, facing death. And yet, as Hebrews reminds us, we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus because for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We look as Jesus has that 50-20 vision. Seeing the joy. Seeing what God would do. Knowing that it was for our sake and for our salvation. That we might receive the good news. That he endured all that was there in that present moment. And in the lives of the disciples as we see each of them faces their death. Each of them goes through all sorts of difficulties because they maintain this 50-20 vision as well. Romans chapter 8, 28, excuse me, in Romans chapter 8, Paul gives us all sorts of stories of what his life has been as a disciple. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul tells us, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us of all of the great things he's accomplished. His life was going really well before he met Jesus. And then From the time where he begins to preach the gospel, he faces trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. He faces death like a sheep to be slaughtered. And yet he says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth the glory that will be revealed in us. Famously, Paul says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Paul never says, persecution and famine and danger and sword is good. But Paul says that in all things, God works for good. 50-20 vision is what Joseph says, you planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it. And this is the kind of vision that we're called and invited to have. To try on those kind of lenses, those kind of glasses. Those who are able to look at all sorts of painful things in our lives and say, you know, that's not good, but God can bring good from it. Divorce is not good, but God can work good from it. Disease is not good, but God can work good from it. Death is not good, but God can bring good from it. Sometimes it takes seven months or seven years or 70 years or even seven generations, but God can bring good from it. As we look at the history of our church and over these past months, we can even say boldly that church votes and splits and splinters are not good, but God can produce good from it, as God indeed is doing. Whatever you face, whatever you so narrowly focus on in this moment of your place of pain and brokenness, I invite you to experience that 50-20 vision. You planned something bad for me, but God is producing something good. Thanks be to God. Amen.